This is the fellow passenger speaking. Today, I've had the great privilege to speak to Caitlin Aurelia Smith, an American electronic music composer who played live at a fairly local venue a few weeks ago. When I left that gig, I can only describe the feeling as similar to reading a really good book or seeing a really great film. Once the film is over, when you close the book after the last page, it feels like you're just back in reality again, as if the music has taken you on the journey. And that's exactly what her music did to me. I had so many questions. And to start with, often when I think of electronic music, it feels cold. And I certainly don't usually associate it with colour or curious emotions, as in, I don't know how to describe it, positive, like a future you want to explore and be in. And those are the things we will be talking about today. I will have a chance to ask her questions about her inspirations, her workflow, where does her creativity come from? and some great tips for you when you are creating. So when I'm speaking to Caitlin, she is in Paris prepping for a gig tonight. So she was in a location where she could unfortunately not use the camera, but it's what she's saying that is important. I can only describe this conversation as incredibly rewarding, and I hope you will find that too. So without further ado, buckle up, sit down comfortably, and enjoy. Okay, Caitlin, thank you so much for doing this interview. Oh yeah, thanks for inviting me. It was nice to meet you um, at my show, and, and here we are now. Yes, Colchester, right? That was that, where we met. Yeah, that's right. And I, I was quite blown away by that show. I have to say, and I have so many questions. Oh, uh, thanks. But before we dive in, if we can just for, if there's someone who is a bit new to you or don't know your history so much, if we could just get a very brief, like musically, what's your, where do you come from? Yeah, I um. I studied classical guitar and sound engineering and orchestration. Um, and, and then after college, I, um, I decided that I wanted to give up on music, <laughs> mostly because I didn't have access to orchestras anymore or like really nice studios. And, um, and, and so I, I remember the day that I, I thought to myself, like, okay, I'm just going to give up on music and do something else. And then a few days later, someone, um, a neighbor offered to let me borrow a Buchla 100. And I had never heard of a Buchla synthesizer. And, and like, to be honest, I didn't really know that much about synthesizers at all at that time. And, um, and so I brought it to my cabin and and just hung out with it for a year and hung out with it in like a really low pressure way because I had decided to give up on music as a career. And so it was just like a friend that I left on all day long and would like do various tasks and, and just like explore it throughout the day. And, and I feel like it really shifted my music making process. Um, and now here I am and I make music with modular synths, particularly um, analog vintage synths. And, and I still very much resonate with the Buchla synthesizers and additive synthesis. Um, and then I like to combine orchestral instruments or instruments where you get a really strong sense of, of breathing and then also my voice. I, I I have to ask because the, the the I haven't had many opportunities to use the book club, but whenever I have, I just don't know where to begin or end. 
I I'm used to using a euro rack and things, but so did you just like learn by doing like the the bucla side of things? Yeah, it's actually that's my favorite way of learning in general is um is like immersion immersion learning and and I really resonate with um you know like music and and actually building I feel like like those are two areas where it has like a it's like a circle you know you just there's no beginning point you just enter depending on what you want to do hmm. and and that type of learning really resonates with me where it's not like a linear step by step process it's like there's a lot of aspects to it and you kind of just have to like do various projects to learn and and I still continue to learn every project that I do is like a new layer and I I feel like it's it really spoke to me um when I was learning it because of the additive quality that like spoke to my classical background of of like really loving the overtone series I I I like the idea of having the instrument in the room because I assume they're right there and then you had sort of already made your mind up that music was not your thing, but that was just a fun thing to have in the room. And then you fell in love with it a bit rather than having the pressure to, I need to make something with this machine now, otherwise I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I definitely had a really strong sense of patience and and I really protect that um, aspect of music making. Like still to this day, I have the same amount of patience when I'm making music and have learned from that process that that is a crucial ingredient for me. Um, and, and even when I'm doing commissioned work for other people and there's a deadline, that patience is still there. I just do it faster. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> um, but, but I also really fell in love with um, uh, having access. It like felt like an interface for me to really connect with electricity because the older synths had components that, that didn't like feel like you were between a glass wall and electricity. Like it felt like I was getting to really interact with it. Did you ever do soldering and things like that? I did a little bit, but I'm not really like, I'm not someone who wants to like build synths or fix them. I just want to make music. Um, yeah. What, what, um, if we move on to your show, which I did not entirely, I didn't really know what to expect. And I think I associate a lot of the things that I've listened to in the past of yours have been quite ambient. And I know you collaborated with Susan Chiani, et cetera. So I didn't really know what to expect, you know, like it was a Sunday evening and I got there and when I left, I would describe the feeling just like when you, cl when you've just finished reading an amazing book or seen an amazing film, all of a sudden you're, back in reality again it's like the music took you somewhere to a new place it's it's almost like you did world building with the music so um oh that means a lot to me thank you and for everyone who were not there or haven't had a chance to see your show would it be fair to describe that you play live and you use projection with like an avatar in this really colorful space that you are sort of controlling to a degree or, or, or it's a, an avatar of, of you is, is, is that what, how, how you would describe it? Yeah. It's, it's like, um, well, I guess there's two parts to it. There's like the technical part and then there's the, the like thematic that's, aspect of it. that's the one I want to dig into the thematic. I want to hear, yeah. I want to hear what's the world, like, what's the story? Where did it come from? Yeah, it, it like really startled me when it came into my world because it like, um, it felt like, I don't know, this is kind of a funny word to say, but it felt, 
It, well, okay. You know, in are you familiar with Buto, that that no. form of dance? No, I don't think I am. It's like um, it's a really beautiful Japanese form of dance, and it's all about the admiration of possession of like allowing your whole being to get possessed by a feeling and to embody it. And, and I remember like the day that this album came into my being and, and I made it so fast. It like only took me two months. And, and now it, because I know that I play live always, like I, I, I'm always thinking about the live set as I'm recording so that I'm not like later uh, fumbling and I'm like, ah, how do I play it? So, so uh, like I felt the character, I felt the voice first and, and I felt these like really weird melodies and I felt the, the like sentiments of the character, um, which I kept on calling it my sentimental robot drama for a while because <laughs> it just felt like it was like this really sentimental like robot. <laughs> um, and the story for me kind of unfolded like after living with this this like entity for for like a few a few months and I don't mean it in like a dark way like an entity possessed me. I, I'm just like using these words poetically. But, um, but after sitting with it for a while, I realized that, that like what was happening, um, psychologically for me was, uh, similar to this, this type of therapy that I was learning, um, cause I'm a somatic therapist and there's a type of, um, like a really useful type of therapy that happens, um, when things are compounded and you can't understand them, um, it's like you have to create a third perspective to understand it. And, and so this entity kind of became this like third objective thing for me to understand some, uh, some things that I was wanting to express. And, and I still to this day, know exactly what I'm expressing, but don't know how to say it in words. And that's why it's called Let's Turn It Into Sound, because it's all about the like expressions that are art, which it's like you can't put it into words. It's like meant to be just expressed through art. Oh, I, I so, so on the way home from the concert, I was going with one of my neighbors and he was just saying, saying something to me that really resonates with what you are telling me now. He said like, there was just as if there was nothing between Caitlin and the music, you know, like there was no, it, it was sort of just like the emotional expression was just like, it was sort of direct contact. And also what you were saying about being closer to the electricity, if that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so neat to hear. That's, that makes me really happy because I was definitely trying to encourage myself to, be braver with being like more vulnerable because because I think expression is so beautiful but it's always hard when it's ourselves and so I was trying to encourage myself to be more open in that that way another thing I was reflecting on because quite a lot of electronic music um sort of slightly less commercial so we say feels um hold and it's 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 a a place it's it's like machine like it's almost like it's it's sometimes in a space where humans don't exist you know <laughs> if, if uh, difficult to explain but it when i heard your music and saw your performance it was almost looking at electronic music from a completely different perspective because it was colorful it was full of emotion. It felt really organic, which feels quite different from what a lot, lot of other electronic music feels like. And therefore, it felt really fresh to me. And also, it felt futuristic, but very positive, rather than often when people uh, imagine the future, it's very dystopian and everything is, 
you know, it's it's sort of a bit uncomfortable uh, and not very emotional. But this was just, it just was fun. And how? Oh, that makes me so happy. But that 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 thing with the the entity that sort of you had in you um, is. It, would you say that that entity was sort of like your collaborator of creating this? Definitely, and I, it like also really connects with something that I really believe of, of like our most, uh, our most, what are the words for it? Like our most hurt parts of ourself are the parts that we need creatively the most. And they're like our best collaborators. And, and it's like creativity can be this beautiful tool to, to, um, transform like a, a trauma or something into um into like a a beautiful collaborator and um and not to say that like this album is about my trauma or anything like that but but i think like uh feelings always kind of have like a gradient to them where they start on like an unprocessed kind of like darker gradient and then when they get to their expression they usually like go to the other side and um so it definitely felt like this collaborator was was helping me with that but I feel that about every creative project I feel like I learn I feel like every project is a teacher for me but would you say that this this entity it's is it almost like it's your um don't take this the wrong way but as a child, you have an imaginary friend and you're almost asking that friend, like, what should we do today? Or, or how does it actually work? <laughs> Cute. I mean, I personification is like my favorite thing ever. <laughs> and so I, I talk to all of my synths and I talk to electricity. I talk to my computer. I talk to all of it. So definitely like, like ideas, I talk to everything. And, and I feel like it's helpful to imagine that there's life on the other side, at least for me, because if, if I'm always imagining that it's me doing everything, you know, it gets a little bit like me focused and that isn't the most fun thing. You're giving them names. <laughs> it's funny. The other day, my tour manager was asking what the entity's name on the screen is. And I was like, ah, oh, I've never given it a name. <laughs> And then we were joking about how it'd be funny to call her like a really like businessy name, like Bruce or Barbara. So like a very, <laughs> very American business name. <laughs> uh, and and when you move on from, from here now, um, the next project, do you see that as being completely a completely new process again? Or will you be building on this concept of the entity and take that further you think no I think it'll be completely new it's it's usually each album is like a whole new perspective new process new wave of creating music um and I have I have the feeling like I know what it's going to be but it, I don't have the words yet to it you have a bunch of what's going to come or like what you're interested in exploring so to say yeah 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 but it probably i think the entity just lives in this album yeah and it's i, I tend to change my voice for for a lot of the albums and i was looking because sometimes it's not crystal clear exactly what words you're using and i was looking up your lyrics and i couldn't quite find them oh yeah i think they're on the um the ghostly website. Hey. Let's see. Now I'm actually curious because I remember someone else asking that. Um, but I'm happy to tell you if you have like a part. <laughs> I But I can't imagine you would remember a part. Um, let's see if it has it. It was more what I was after is just generally dipping into more of the story. Hmm. Like, yeah. Because I'm I'm imagining things happening in my head when I hear it but like 
it, it felt like such a the whole experience was such world building. So I was just curious to find out more about it. Yeah, it kind of walks through. Um, let's see, I'm pulling up because I play a different order live than I do um, on the actual album. And so I was trying to think about which story because it's almost like two different stories, um, which order they're in. And I guess I should say the live one because that's the one that you yes. saw. Um, just give me, I, I can probably look the ghostly thing up, but if you just give me a little bit of an idea of, is there a, 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 a narrative throughout, like regardless of which order they are in, is there a sort of a narrative there? Yeah, it's mostly about the somatic process. And, and the album came with a little book that I wrote about... Um, somatic hearing which is like uh there's two books that i wrote one's like a little listening book and one is somatic hearing and it's all about how uh hearing and listening are two different things and sorry um if that beeped really loud um but yeah about how hearing and listening are two different things in my opinion um like listening is you know using your your physical ear, you're using your hairs on your body to listen. Um, and hearing is like, it's like a, um, like your organs are hearing, like you're, you know, it's like a full being type of a thing. It's, it's also not usually like to audible things. It's more like a felt thing. And, and so the album is, is kind of like each song is taking you through or it's, it's like these vignettes and they're all taking you through the layers of somatic hearing. Cause somatic hearing is kind of, it's like a process of going through the layers of, of understanding the intelligence of your nervous system. Like of when you walk in the room, it's like you're feeling a lot of things at once. And, and so it's like going through the different layers of that. And that's why the songs go through so many transitions. Cause it's like, it's uh trusting the process of of like all the layers connect and they all have something to share and um and definitely inspired by um like the or i guess all my albums are really inspired form wise by the the golden ratio like the every part is the same as it's whole that, you have that as a tattoo haven't you I think yeah I, I, yeah you, you're playing is it on fact tv you're playing live and i spotted it yeah yeah that's definitely like always a really important aspect of like finishing an album for me is like what is the whole story and then making sure that every part is like talking about the whole narrative did you ever literally try to space it out you know like literally when you're composing like arranging the notes using the golden late ratio literally i've never done that but um but i yeah i'd be curious i don't usually use that part of my brain when i'm writing music i use that part of my brain when i'm like um in my engineer side um but like when i'm writing music it's like very much my like intuitive flow and then if I'm like orchestrating or editing or whatnot, then my like mathy side comes on. And you do do that part with the other part of the brain. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm just conscious of time. How 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 are we doing your your way? Do oh you... yeah, I'm good. We can keep going. Going. Um. The the writing process. I I've seen the little clip. Obviously, when you see you, when when you when I saw you live there in Colchester, it's difficult to see the detail of what you are doing. And then I was looking at that clip on YouTube. I think it's for Fact TV or something. And you're doing so much, as in, like you have so many things running at the same time. By the looks of it, you got the modular, and you had several keyboards. And I don't think you see everything. How how <laughs> how do you? <laughs> If, generally do you write live i i got a feeling that you're perhaps perhaps not you know like you're away from the computer most of the time when you are writing is that fair 
to say? Yeah. Yeah. I really like, um, I'm a very physical person and I really like movement. Like I love feeling, um, movement and, and so, um, for a lot of my live sets, I'll like make sure that when I'm well, because like the live set and the writing process are one in the same for me, like it's like basically already written before I record it, like, like the live sets already figured out. So as I'm doing both, I'm constantly thinking about like, like, oh, I don't want to just spend too much time on my right hand over here. The next part I'm going to write is going to be where I have to cross my hand over. And then I just practice it for a year till it's in like muscle memory. Wow. But do you, do you, uh, does it, if, do you think that, um, have an impact on the music you write or is it more that you position the instruments in a particular way so you can reach them in the right order? So you, you come up with the music and then you arrange your instruments so you can physically play it. Or do you think, how does that work? Um, sometimes. It just depends. I think it's a little bit of both. Like, like oftentimes they like kind of ping pong back and forth where it's like, maybe I'll, I'll come up with an idea and then I'll be like, well, this is like, I like this idea, but I'm staying too much in this one position. Like, I just know myself that, that like, if I stay in the same position for too long, when I'm performing live, I start to like, kind of leave the present moment because I get um, like a little bit lost in the music part of it. And so I have to personally keep myself really grounded or else I'll just like forget what I'm doing and <laughs> and just like kind of leave, <laughs> check out. <laughs> um, Sorry, go on. And so like creating more of a choreography for myself, or it's not really a choreography, it's more of like a playground of constant crossing helps me stay in a flow state where I'm grounded and I'm present and it gives me so much to do that I'm not thinking about feeling nervous in front of people. I, so when you, when you are writing and if you're using a lot of vintage equipment and, and the bookla, et cetera, it's not as if, if you're working on one piece of music that you click save and then you work on another piece of music you know like it if you or, or do you generally set up a, a patch or something and, and that's how your instrument is then working and you, then you sort of use that to perform rather than swapping equipment around do you choose to select pieces that you will be working with it that... it kind of varies and has changed like uh the more I play shows, the more I learn certain things where I'm like, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't write the album with this because this is going to be really um, annoying to bring around. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing in the video where you have, I think you have two quite big Eurorack cases as well. <laughs> things. And rather than swap things around. Yeah, yeah, those were on loan to me. And and like the, I definitely separate music by like what I'm going to play live, like what's going to be like my thing I'm bringing out into the world. And then just like pieces where I know I'm never going to play that live. And there's definitely some songs on certain albums where I'm like that I'll never play that live. Um, and and for the most part, like I will come up with with like what would be like compact to travel with and um and set up like like well the reason why i'm hesitating right now is because it, it was so different from like this live set was so different from the last one where the last live set i did bring out a euro rack system and that one i did a lot of live patching and a lot of um like it was really interactive with the patching aspect of it. And I would have my, like a system of where I would start. I organized the modules in the order that I was going to use them. And, and I would start from the left. Like I organized the songs as well so that I would always start 
with the left module and make my way across and then down and repeat that so that I would always be like patching ahead of time for the next song as I'm finishing or as there's like a moment where the note is longer and that was really stressful for me so I um for this live set I was like okay no more euro rack and that and euro rack didn't really speak to me um for what I'm creating right now um I guess I have a a sem module that's that's euro rack but um but this one is is not so much about like changing the patch. There's like a few things that I changed, but for the most part, it was about making music, like playing music, like these are instruments and, um, and just knowing like how to make the sounds from the patch that, that is there, like how to have versatility. Cause I really do think that you can have, um, you can create one patch and you can make sounds for like years with that one patch. Um, like I, that's how I really like to work. Um, and yeah, I don't know if that answered it. Sorry. I hope I'm not. No, no, I think that, <laughs> I think that's that what you said there, right at the end, I think it's no matter if it's your or whatever that you, if you create an instrument and that's, you learn that instrument rather than yeah. I've got a bad habit, you know, like I sort of repatch and move stuff around and then I have to sort of start again rather than becoming really good really good at something that i've <laughs> when you in your um what do you listen to when you are just at home and want to listen to some music is it electronic or is it lots of other types of things um it depends right now well, I have, I have an NTS show where I'm constantly sharing what I'm listening to. And then, um, and then right now, the, besides the NTS show, the time that I listen to music the most is when I'm doing my like physical activities. And so I tend to listen to like a lot of dance music during that time. Good exercise. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Have you have you come across Mr. Motivator? Mr. Motivator? I think it's 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 some VHS tape of exercise videos, but it's sort of classical music in the background and Oh anyway, really? <laughs> that's what I've been I using. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been using recently. But yes, I suppose I still need to do a bit more exercise. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's on YouTube. Um so before we wrap up, if you would give some advice to aspiring music makers, what would you like to say to them to find happiness in music making? Oh, um, I think it's kind of what I would say to anyone um, with like any creative process. And and I don't mean for this to come from a place of like, I know, cause I definitely don't know, but from my experience, um, I feel like creativity is, is uh, it's like a, an act of compassion and um, meaning that like, it's not really something that that can be forced like it doesn't really do a lot of wonderful things when it's forced it's like something that wants to unfold um slowly and i feel like like we all open up to people you know when we feel compassion or kindness or acceptance and i think that creativity is like that where it's like when you feel acceptance of the process and what might come out or feel kindness or compassion towards what might come out and not judging it. And just like, if it's bad, it's fine. You don't have to share it with anyone, you know, just like let it go through all of its, its facets. Would you almost say that the, the creativity is an entity that you make friends with? You know, um, I mean, I, I think of creativity as 
like a it's your it's yourself like it's like a it's self it's almost like um it's like how you are connecting with creativity in my opinion is how you're connecting with yourself so like if i'm ever experiencing a block creatively i it usually for me means that i'm like either you know feeling a lot of emotions or like i don't trust myself or there's like something going on with my with my relationship with myself and um and so i guess like like the biggest thing that I've noticed, because I've done some consulting sessions with people, um, helping them make make music or like if they're feeling creatively blocked and and the biggest thing that I see people have in common is um, is just like fear of what might come out, like like it's almost like cutting off the the channel before it even comes out because they're afraid of what like might come out they're afraid of it sounding bad um so i guess it's just like being okay with those parts but i don't know <laughs> beautiful I, I i i i like the idea of i, I can certainly sympathize with the moments when i've I can't think of doing something creative. It's pro it's usually because there is something else occupying my mind that somehow takes the attention somehow. And you just Yeah. So do, do you have like one last thing then? So do you have a little trick that you do when you are not in the right state of mind to loosen up and being able to find your way back? Yeah, I think it's really pragmatic for me. Like, it's kind of like, you know, if I were to want to learn how to do a backflip right now, it's like I wouldn't expect myself to just get up and know how to do a backflip. Like, I would need to approach it in a few ways. You know, I'd want to, like, first look around to make sure there's, like, some safety <laughs> that I know what I'm going to do, that I, like, have a progression I can do that's, like, going to be attainable. And, and I, I feel like approaching creativity in that way is, is really helpful of like safety, like making sure you feel safe to express, like ready to express. And, and I guess to answer your question, that's like what my go-to thing would be is like asking myself a series of questions, like, am I ready to express something? If not, like why, why not? And um, and then if I am ready to express myself, like, like, do I have the tools? Do I like the, the like environment that I'm creating in? Do I know the language yet that I want to express in? Um, and just like really approach it the same way as learning any skill. That's great. Thank you so much. I, I shall not be taking up any more of your time, um, but I've, I'm really grateful that you've taken this moment to to share your thoughts and your process and where your creativity come from. And I'm really looking forward to hear and be surprised with what's going to come next. Is there any last thing for you before, before we, before we wrap up? Um, oh, just that this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you for reaching out. I appreciate all your questions. Thank you so much. It's been, it's, it's been super. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Let's stop.